Good afternoon, and I'd like to welcome you to our celebration for Passion of Good Friday. My name is Father Bill McDonald, and uh, I'm happy to be able to celebrate. It's a bit different, but uh, it's a celebration of the word, and then we welcome all our parishioners and anyone else who is viewing with us today. So let us pray. Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection, sanctify your servants, for whom Christ, your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal Mystery. This we ask through Christ our Lord. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the sons of man. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before the Lord, like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. Each has turned to their own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked, and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make 
many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Speak to God. The Responsorial Psalm. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. Father, into your hands, hands I commend my spirit. I am the scorn of all my adversaries, a horror to my neighbors, an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I have passed out of mind like one who is dead. I have become like a broken vessel. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the, from the hand of my enemies and persecutor, persecutors. Father, Father into, into your hand, hand I commend my spirit. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. Be strong and let your heart take courage. All you who wait for the Lord. Father, Father into your, your hands, hands I commend my spirit. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise to you, Lord. King of eternal glory. Christ became obedient for us to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him and gave him the name above every name. Praise to you, Lord King of eternal glory. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. After they had eaten the supper, Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden 
which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers, together with police, from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he has spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas, who was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people, Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? Peter said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would have not handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, 
Take from yourselves and judge him according to your law. They replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You ask this on your own accord, or did others tell you about me? I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. So you are a king? You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. What is truth? After he had said this, Pilate went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look. I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. They answered him, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to be done because he is claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. Pilate said to Jesus, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the people read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. 
Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clophus, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, in order to fulfill the scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one, because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of pearl and aloes weighing about a hundred weight. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloth, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified. And in the garden, there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there.
The liturgy that we have celebrated here today presents to us a Jesus and his suffering and his dying on the cross for our eternal salvation, for you and me. And the passion of the Lord takes us step by step, we might say, with Jesus along the path leading to the tomb. And God's plan, not man's plan, God's plan of redemption is unraveled for us. A plan that is foreign to us. It doesn't make sense. But it's a challenge for each and every one of us to understand. Could not God have saved us without the suffering and death of his son, Jesus? Yes, he could. But we will never fully understand the mystery of God's plan. Death and new life almost seem a contradiction to our understanding. God's plan that Jesus must die in order to save us kind of eludes us at times and we believe, for we believe that Jesus is our savior. And we believe that Jesus suffering and death took place so he could lead us to a new life. And this mystery of our faith is center of what we do as followers of Christ. It's very real. And Christ brings us out in his life, the love that he has, not for everyone, but for you and for me, for all. And it's important that we see it in an individual way. That's how important I am to God. And so when we go the way of the cross, is what Jesus went through for us. And we all go through we might say the way of the cross, when we suffer, when we die, I. and yet through that, we become new create creatures. Really, we enter this mystery of faith every time that we celebrate together. We celebrate the Eucharist. Here, when we celebrate the Eucharist, we die with Christ to rise with him to a new life. And the purpose of the suffering and death of Jesus remains clear. It's for our eternal salvation, a new life in Christ. And so as we celebrate this liturgy today, we react naturally with sorrow and compassion, but also with gratitude and love and making it personal. That's God's love for me. And when I look at the crucifix, as Christ in a very intimate way manifesting his love. And so we honor the cross for that reason, that it was kind of a means of Christ showing his love for us. And so, as we gather this Good Friday, we thank the Father who so loved the world 
that he sent his son for you and for me. Today we thank the son whose love for the father and for us caused him to do is then care for his father's will and endure the agony of Calvary. I can remember as a young boy, remembering being taught by the sisters and how they tried to bring this home, that if there's no other person in the world except for you, that Christ would still die this way because of the love that he has for you. And it made it very real to me. And when I'm down and alone and at times wondering who cares, God cares. And we look at that cross and that's the manifestation of his love and care. And so finally we thank the Holy Spirit who moves Christ's church, to Christ, to put Christ before us. Not only just on Good Friday, but every time we come together as brothers and sisters and celebrate the Eucharist. And so, my dear friends, the cross proves God's love for us. And we know that all of us carry crosses. We know through God's love that they are never that heavy that they will put us down. They'll hold us up. And even the difficult time that we're going through now with the crisis of the virus, and it's so easy to become despondent and say, you know, where are you, God? He's there. He's with us because he loves us. May God bless We now have the solemn intercessions. Let us pray, my dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her, to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that, leading our life in tranquility and quietness, we may glorify God, the Father Almighty. And Almighty God, when in Christ you revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy that your church spread throughout the world may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. And let us pray also for our most holy father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him, the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed, for the Lord's Holy Church to govern the holy people of God. This we ask through Christ our Lord. And almighty and ever living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on your prayers and in your kindness protect Francis, our chosen, who you have chosen for us, that under him, the Christian people may govern you, their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith. This we ask through Christ our Lord.
And let us pray also for our bishops, our Bishop Michael, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty and ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace, all may serve you faithfully. This we ask through Christ our Lord. We pray for catechumens. Let us pray for them that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ. Jesus, our Lord. And almighty and eternal God, who makes your church every fruitful with new offerings, increase the faith and understanding of your catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children. This we ask through Christ our Lord. And let us pray also for our brothers and sisters who believe in Jesus Christ, that God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Almighty and ever-living God, who gathers what is scattered and keeps together what you have gathered, look kindly in the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Let us pray for all the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them love in his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Let us pray, too, also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that we may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty and eternal God, who bestowed promises of Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attest, attain, attest the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. And we pray, too, for those who do not believe in Jesus Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they, too, may enter into the way of salvation. Almighty and everlasting God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth, and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. And we pray, too, for those who do not acknowledge God that following what is right in sincerity of heart, 
they may find the way to God himself. Almighty and ever-living God, who created all peoples to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you, come to rest. Grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of your good works done by those who believe in you and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of the human race, through Christ our Lord. And let us pray, too, for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Almighty and ever-living God, in whose hands lies every human heart and the rights of people, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, the freedom of religion, may through your gift be made secure. This we ask through Christ our Lord. And we pray too, my dearly beloved, to God our Father, we pray to God that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return to health and salvation to all the dying. And almighty and ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil. May the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice, because in their honor of need, the hour of need, your mercy was at hand. This we ask through Christ our Lord. And finally, Lord, let us pray for a swift end to the coronavirus pandemic that afflicts our world. That our God and Father who heals the sick, strengthens those who care for them, and helps us all to persevere in faith. Almighty and merciful God, source of all life, health, and healing, look with compassion on our world, brought low by this disease. Protect us in the midst of the great challenges that assail us, and in your fatherly providence, Grant recovery to the stricken, strength to those who care for them, and success to those working to eradicate this scourge. This we ask through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Father, one God, forever and ever. And now we will have the veneration of the cross. We'll bring it up in, to the front. And we will then venerate it there.
Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior of the world. Come, let us adore. Restore the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior of the Lord. Come, let us adore. <clears throat> Restore the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior of the world. Come, let us adore. At the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our day, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Receiving the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, not bring me the remembrance of his enemy, but through your loving memory, be for me protection of mind and body. This we ask through grace. And behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord,
By Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most blessed sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and united myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. This we ask through Christ. And let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who has restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you. This we ask. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Bow your heads for God's blessing. May abundant blessings, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son Jesus in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, and holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Go in peace, and God be with you. Thank you.